In the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Mark S. asks us, why does brown sugar form lumps but regular sugar doesn't? When we say the word sugar, it's highly likely that the first image that pops into your head is that of the ultra-fine, pure white, granulated kinds that you can buy in most supermarkets. But how does this kind of sugar differ from the less popular brown kind, and why isn't it as prone to forming into lumps as its dusky cousin? To properly answer this question, we'll first delve into how sugar as in common table sugar rather than other short-chain sweet soluble carbohydrates is produced in the first place because it's really key to understanding how the white variety differs from brown sugar and why the latter often clumps together. Beyond that, it's also just pretty interesting. As you're probably aware, the common sugar you can buy in stores is primarily derived from one of two things. Sugar cane, from which it's estimated 70% of the world's sugar is produced, and sugar beet. While the refining process for each crop differs slightly, the end product is identical. We say this because you might hear from people and companies that use sugar cane for their sugar that sugar from sugar cane is superior to sugar that is extracted from beets. Among other reasons sometimes mentioned, one notable one is because beet sugar can sometimes be derived from beets that have been genetically modified. For those curious, since table sugar is literally just sucrose, the source it's derived from doesn't affect the final product in any way, assuming the manufacturer keeps any impurities down to a negligible level, which they do. In any event, sugarcane and sugar beets are the most common sources of sugar because they contain a high concentration of sucrose that is relatively easy to extract. Sugarcane, for example, is about 10% sugar by weight, meaning for every 10 kilos of sugarcane you harvest, you can reasonably expect to get about 1 kilogram of sugar in return, depending on the quality of the cane and the efficiency of the methods used to extract it. The amount of sugar in a sugar beet, on the other hand, can vary quite a bit, though beets can sometimes contain as much as 17% of their weight in pure sugar. This can change depending on how mature the beets are and where they are grown. From this, you might think that in the right regions, beets are the way to go for sugar producers. However, beet farms produce significantly less sugar than cane farms per hectare, 7 tons per hectare compared to 10 tons per hectare for sugarcane, because the beets take up more space and are generally more difficult to cultivate as they need to be replanted every single year. In contrast, sugarcane will continue to regrow for years after being harvested, as long as the roots of the plant are left undisturbed. After harvesting, the basic process of extracting sugar from both cane and beets is fairly similar, with the exception that because beets are physically removed from the ground, they need to be washed, cleaned, and sliced before any sugar can be extracted. In contrast, sugarcane is ready to have sugar extracted almost immediately after being harvested. After this initial processing is done, both are soaked in water and then they are crushed to extract as much juice from them as possible. This juice is then boiled to remove much of the water from it, leaving behind a thick, viscous syrup, which itself is then spun in a centrifuge after some more boiling, separating the pure sugar crystals that form at the bottom of the mixture. The sugar that forms at the bottom of the mixture will then be dried and bleached, giving it the pure white texture we're all familiar with before being packaged and shipped off for consumption. The syrupy mixture left over after producing sugar is known as molasses or treacle in the United Kingdom, and it is similarly packed and sold off after production. However, sometimes manufacturers will mix some of this back in with the white sugar, producing what most of us would recognize as brown sugar. The exact amount of molasses added varies from manufacturer to manufacturer, but for the most part it falls between 3 and 7%, with the latter producing dark brown sugar and the former producing light brown sugar. A third kind of brown sugar, often sold as natural brown sugar, exists and is made by simply foregoing the extra step of separating the molasses from the sugar in the first place. Since all kinds of brown sugar contain molasses, which itself contains water, it can dry out, which is what causes brown sugar to harden and form into lumps if it's left out in the open or stored improperly. This is a problem that doesn't occur with white table sugar because, as we already mentioned, it is thoroughly dried before being packaged and shipped. That said, white sugar can become lumpy if it absorbs too much moisture, a common problem in high humidity environments if the sugar is improperly stored. In both cases, fixing the problem is as simple as either drying the sugar out or putting the moisture back in, depending on which kind it is. Common methods for this include, for hardened brown sugar, leaving a slice of bread in a sealed container with the brown sugar overnight. For white table sugar, you can dry it out by placing it in a warm oven for a few hours. And now for some bonus facts. As you might have guessed, if you have even a basic understanding of how the body uses sugars, contrary to popular belief, sugar does not make kids hyper. 
Nevertheless, as illustrated in one study, Effects of Sugar Ingestion Expectancies on Mother-Child Interactions, it was found that mothers who think their kids have been given sugar, even though their kids haven't been given any, will almost always say their kids are acting hyper. On the flip side, if they think their kids haven't been given sugar, even if they have in actuality, they will almost always say their kids are acting normal, even though in both cases there is no actual discernible difference in the behavior being observed between the two situations. It's almost all just in the parent's head. Almost is not totally, though. If they believe they haven't been given sugar, even though they've been given loads, these kids will report no change in how they feel and they will act normal. If they are given no sugar but think they've been given lots of sugar, they will often report feeling a sugar rush and act hyper. This is more or less just the mysterious placebo effect in action. While it may seem like cotton candy, which is made of pure sugar, sometimes with food coloring or other flavoring added, would be pretty much the worst thing in the world for you to eat, it should be noted that it only takes about 30 grams of sugar to make a typical serving size of cotton candy, which is about 9 grams less than a 12-ounce can of Coke. Further, cotton candy has no fat, no preservatives, and is only about 115 calories per serving. While certainly not a health food nor filling in any way, there are numerous things that people consume every day that are much worse for them health-wise. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, you know what to do. Smash that like button below. And if you enjoyed this video, you're definitely going to enjoy our podcast, which is called The Brain Food Show. It's a longer form exploration of topics just like this. If you want to find that, just search Brain Food, one word in whatever app you use to get your podcasts, and you will find it. And as always, thank you for watching.